Book of Jeremiah 29. It's good to be in the house of God already. Amen. The bucket's flying by. Jeremiah 29. And uh, hearts are fully blessed. God wants to do something in your heart. Music touches your heart. Preaching ought to touch your heart. And uh, for God to do that, the heart has to be soft. And then, if you have a hard heart, if you begin to vibrate something that's hard and rigid, uh, it'll, it'll fall apart. Bridges and big buildings, they make them where they have a little bit of sway. They can stand the earth, earthquakes and things, the wind. And uh, your heart's got to be just soft enough to where God can speak to it, move it, and uh, it won't crumble. And that's what music is, is to prepare the heart for, uh, for the preaching. And then uh, Jeremiah 29. Uh, Jeremiah is called a weeping prophet, and uh, he usually preaches messages of doom and gloom, and his main message is a call uh, for repentance. Uh, we need more weeping prophets, I believe. Uh, I think it's interesting, you know, if turn there, God said, Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Uh, he said, Jeremiah, before you were even conceived, I formed thee. And I knew who you were, and I had a calling upon your life, and I'm going to have you go preach to people. And like all the prophets, God pretty much told him, he said, they're not going to listen to you for the most part, but there are going to be a few people that will listen to you, Jeremiah. And I want you to go preach my word no matter what. And look here in verse number uh, one. He's speaking here to the elders and the remnant. He says, uh, Jeremiah 29, verse one. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders, which were carried away captives. And to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Jeconiah, the king, the, and the queen, and the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. By the hand of Elasa, the son of Sharpen, and Gamariah, the son of Hukiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent into Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. This is what he's telling the children of Israel. He says, Jeremiah, tell them this. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, those are grandchildren, that ye may be increased there, and not diminish. And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For the peace thereof shall ye have, uh, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. Notice he's saying false prophets are going to come up that are going to tell you uh, positive things. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name, and I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you, and causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Yeah. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, God. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word, your wonderful book, God. And I pray, Lord, you give us something from it. Lord, I pray that you were pleased with all the singing, all the specials, all the congregational hymns. Lord, any giving of tithes and offerings, Lord, that was done this morning, God. I pray, Lord, you'd be pleased with them, Lord. But now for the next few minutes, God, I pray you'd anoint me, God, uh, to preach the message, Lord, I believe you'd have for us in these last days. God, prepare our hearts, Lord, to be changed, Lord, for the better. I love you. I thank you and praise you. And I call us in Jesus Christ's name. And amen. Amen. Jeremiah here is speaking to the remnant. Verse number one, it says a residue. 
Uh, it says there that he is preaching to, uh, uh, from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away. A residue just means something that remains after a part is taken away or separated. A residue is something that's left over. He's speaking to a group of people that's just left over. A remnant, you could say. And he was telling them that things were not going to get better. And he was telling them that things were not going to uh, be better these next couple of years. He was telling them they're not going to be delivered. He was preaching to people that he loved to his own people. And he's telling them, he's saying, I'm going to let you know that 70 years is going to go by before it's going to get any better here. I'm letting you know that God's going to keep us in captivity for another 70 years. And it's not going to get better. Uh, they're not going to get out of jail free. They're not going to have a get out of jail free card. Uh, they're not going to uh, get, uh, get, get excuse, they're going to be excused from uh, what's going on. He said, you're going to have to endure something for 70 years. It's going to be a while before things get better. That was his message to them. He says, so while you're there, notice he tells them to do four things. He says, build a house, plant a garden, marry somebody, and have kids. Build a house, plant a garden, marry somebody, and have kids. Keep in mind, Babylon was not where they wanted to be, but they were against the will of God. Babylon is not where they wanted to live. It's not with the people that they wanted to live with. It's not the situation that they wanted, but they were against the perfect will of God. And they had to accept where they were. They had to accept where they were so God could eventually get them to where he wanted them to be. And they not only had to accept where they were, but they had to accept that it was God that brought them there. And folks, can I tell you this? It can be a good thing or a bad thing, but it should be a comforting thing this morning that you are where you are in your life because God has brought you there. Amen. It wasn't your mother. It wasn't your father. It wasn't your upbringing. It wasn't your brothers and sisters. It wasn't your environment. It wasn't the way that you were born. You are today where you are because God brought you yeah, there. Great. And whether you got here because you've been bumping your head up against the wall, living wrong for years and years, God brought you here today. He brought you to the, the where you are in your life today. Uh, but God is the one that brought you and I to where we are today day. They had to accept where they were. They had to accept that's where God put them. Verse 4 says, whom I have caused to be carried away. He didn't say it was, he didn't say it was Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't blame it on the government. He, God said, I caused them to be carried away captive. Verse uh, 14 says, I will bring you again to the place whence I have caused you to be carried away. He says, whither I have driven you there in verse number 14. God said, I'm the one that brought you to where you are. And God is saying, I have an expected end for you. But before I can get you to where I want you to be, you have to accept where you are. And folks, the permissive will of God, which is where they are, God is permitting things to happen, permitting evil to happen to them. The permissive will of God, if acted upon correctly, will lead to the divine will of God. And I'm not trying to confuse you or anything. The divine will of God is what God already had planned out. It's his perfect divine will. He already had the idea in his head. He said, this is what's going to come to pass, and this will happen, because I, God, have already thought about it. I've already planned it out. It's going to happen. The permissive will of God is everything that happens in between. You and I can either go right along that perfect will of God, or we can stray, we can veer to the left and to the right. But right now, the children of Israel have been straying for years and years, and God's saying, I have an expected end where I want to bring you to, but right now you're in my permissive will. But the permissive will of God, if acted upon correctly, can still lead to the divine will of God. And God will permit and allow things in your and I's life. He'll allow us to make the wrong decision and reject His perfect will. He'll chastise us. But that doesn't mean He's done with us. People could confuse the chastisement of God with God being done with them. No, God's not done with them. He's just chastising them. And you say, Aaron, I don't really understand the permissive will of God or, or the divine will of God or the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Can I just tell you something this morning? If you're a child of God, it doesn't matter whether you're in the perfect, whether you're in the good will of God, the acceptable will of God, the divine will of God. Can I tell you this? It's just good being in the will of God. Amen. 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 And if you're a child of God, you're already, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. That means you're in his will already. So whether you're in the good, the perfect, the, uh, the permissive will of God, the divine will of God, the acceptable will of God, as long as you're in the will of God, things will work out. Amen. They will work out. And notice he said you have to seek the peace of the city in verse 7. If you're going to have peace from the city, seek the peace of the city. Meaning you're going to have to get comfortable where you are right now because you're going to be there a while. So while you're there, get settled in, relax, 
Take your belongings and sit them in the pew beside you because you're going to be there a while. And some of you are saying, is he heading around and he's going to be preaching for a while? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> hey, Amen. I'm just saying you can apply it practically however you want. But he's saying you're going to be there a while. You know people who said back in 2020, they said, I can't wait for 2020 to be over. They probably didn't know this. Maybe they went to public school. Maybe they were homeschooled. I don't know. But what comes after 2020 is 2021. <laughs> and it's here. Hello, 2021. Things didn't get better in the nation. Things didn't get better in the church overall. God brought a famine. He brought a plague upon uh, the, the world. He's brought hurricanes. He's brought tornadoes. He's brought uh, wildfires. He, he brought all kinds of things on this world in 2020. And you know what? In 2021, most people are about the same as they were in 2019. 2020. They haven't grown closer to God. They haven't, they haven't sought after God. They've just complained about the way that things were in 2020. And they have some mixed up thing in their head that God works on a 12-month calendar. And God's going to say, oh, once a new, once a new year comes, 2021, I'm just going to take everything. I'm going to take COVID away. I'm going to take communism away. I'm going to take pain and depression and sicknesses and illnesses away. I'm going to take famines away. I'm going to take anxiety away. I'm going to take drug abuse away. All the prodigals are all going to come home. Everybody's going to get saved. The churches are going to be full. Man, I'm just going to take it all away in 2021. No, he didn't take it away in 2021. And folks, I'm not going to stand up and tell you like a lot of preachers did that 2022 is going to be any better. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it's going to get better, that things are going to be nicer, things are going to get happier, we're going to get our freedoms back. Well, I'm not going to tell you those things this morning because I don't know if they're true. But I know this, Jeremiah told them, he said that while you're there, get settled in because you're going to be there a while. And I didn't know really how to title this message. I thought about titling it, it, it all won't be over soon. I think that occurred me. <laughs> <laughs> it all won't be over soon. And I thought about titling it this, Developed in Darkness. Developed in Darkness. You say, Aaron, what do you mean? A long time ago, cameras were big and large. Back in the 1800s, they were expensive. They were complicated to run. Um, you couldn't take a picture. You couldn't get a picture of something until that, that page that the picture was taken on. It had to go and be developed. Developed. Y'all heard of a picture being developed. Non-digital cameras are uh, things that uh, they had film inside of them. It, it was invented around the 1800s. And camera film is a big plastic substance called a celluloid. And it would, it would basically, it would just, there would be a flash, a big flash. Boom, you see the picture? You see the old movies where they, they put their head inside that thing? And they go, all right. They don't say smile because all the pictures back then were all, <laughs> I guess. But you see their head there and they go, boom. You see a big flash of light. That, that, pic, that uh, paper, a certain type of paper that would react to that light, what they would do is they'd have to go and take that into a room that was called a dark room where all the lights would be turned off. And they would take that paper and they'd cut it up into separate pieces that were called negatives. Those pieces of paper were called negatives. The negatives were then used to project the photographic image stored onto them uh, onto, an, uh, onto a special paper. And they put it down into water, into a certain a solution there with chemicals in it. And uh, uh, the, the photographer, he'd take that to a, a room and it's called a dark room. It's completely dark. With just very minimal light, uh, so that, that way that paper wasn't affected by the other lights, and you get a clear image that would come out. And they were called dark rooms. Because of the popularity of digital photography like we have on our phones and, and digital cameras, dark rooms aren't as popular anymore, nobody uses them. The process can take a long time to complete, and it's expensive. You say, what are you getting at? Although this is an old principle that not many people use anymore, God still takes a long time and often dark circumstances to develop people. It's not popular. It's not easy. It, it, it's costly. The trying of your faith is as precious gold, Peter said. It, it, it costs something to develop character in a person, to develop strength in a person, to develop uh, faith in a person, to develop your, your uh, long-suffering, your gentleness to other people, your grace. It takes a long time to do those things. But folks, God's not in a hurry to develop character in us, wisdom, long-suffering, strength, love, peace, joy. And you can relate it to whatever you want to. A COVID, a, you can talk about people have lost their jobs, how they're in a dark place, their, their normal flow of life was disrupted, they feel like they have freedoms taken away, they feel like they lost their sense of identity like the children of Israel did here. Or you can apply it personally. You can go through some things sometimes, and if, God, if you're going to give God a chance to work on you, you've got to be willing to go to the dark room. So he can develop you into the image he wants you to be like. Folks, I would say this, we're all different. We're all different. 
And we all look different this morning. But God wants to develop each and every one of us in a different way, but it's for a similar purpose. He's wanting us to look more like His Son, Jesus Christ. And He does that sometimes in a dark place, in a dark room. He's trying to develop you and I. I talk about being developed in darkness. Why did God allow this evil to come upon them? This judgment, this captivity, this bondage, these persecutions. Why did He allow this darkness? I'm going to give you three things that will be done this morning. Why did He allow it to happen? Number one, I believe he wanted them to restore their focus. To restore their focus. You notice he gave them four objectives. I'll give them to you quickly again. The four objectives. He said, number one, build a house. Number two, plant a garden. Number three, marry somebody. And number four, have kids. Build a house, plant a garden, marry somebody, and have kids. Build a house, plant a garden, marry somebody, and have kids. Build a house, plant a garden, marry somebody, and have kids. See, the Lord is taking them through a painful purging process, and the end has not come yet, and it's not coming anytime soon. But the Lord has a plan for them. He, has, he gave those four objectives to them. He has a plan for them during the process. Can I ask you this this morning? What are you doing during the process? During the process. While everything's shut down, the world's going to hell, people are frantic, people are nervous. Are you getting more nervous? Are you getting more anxious? Are you listening to the things of this world more than what you listen to godly music and, and good Christian preaching? Are you talking to people of this world more than what you're talking to the house of God? Are you got your, your attention off, your focus off? Or are you following the Lord's plan? Are you backsliding or are you abounding in times of darkness? Are you getting bitter or are you being thankful in times of darkness? Are you lost or are you seeking God in times of darkness? Are you dying or are you growing in darkness? Notice the Lord had a plan for them and a purpose for it all. Verse 6 is His purpose. Verse 6. He says, Take you wives, beget sons and daughters. Take wives to your sons and give daughters to your husbands, that you may bear sons and daughters. Why? That you may be increased there and not diminished. You know what God's purpose was at all for it all? He wanted them to be greater coming out than whenever they went into it. He wanted them to come out better on the other side than whenever they went into it. He must have been telling them, you can still grow under limitations. You can still grow under limitations. You know what COVID's made a lot of us do? It's made a lot of people sit around with their spouse all day that they used to only spend a few minutes with a day. It's made them talk, why are y'all laughing? Amen. Somebody's really laughing. Uh, it made you spend more time with your spouse. It probably made you spend more time with your children. More time with your family. More time at your house and not out in the world. You couldn't go to the places that you used to go. You had to spend time at the house. Maybe God's trying to tell us you can't grow while you're moving around all the time. If I'm going to get you to grow, I've got to get you to just stay somewhere long enough to where I can restore your focus on the things that really matter. Sometimes God has to put us on our back physically, physically just to get us to quit moving around. I was reading about a, a sheep shearing there the other day. I know that you all know that we're referred to as sheep. I know that you've heard a lot of message on, on the shearing of sheep. God sometimes has to take away that, that, that coat from us, that covering from us. It's for our benefit, but he has to do that for us. He has to take things off of us. You want to know how God or how a shepherd or a, a shearer will shear the sheep? He puts his left thumb, they said, into the, the back of the sheep's mouth by the incisor's teeth where it won't get bit. And then it takes its other right hand and puts it down there in the right thigh where its strength is, where it can kick, and you, you pinch it there, kind of make it buckle. And you bend the sheep's head sharply over the right shoulder, swing the sheep towards you, and then you lower the sheep down to the ground as you step back. You lower it towards you, then you step back, lower it to the ground, so it's flat on the ground with her, so she's sitting on her rump, the sheep. And as you begin to shear, you're constantly keeping the sheep pinned down to you and held down so that they won't move. And an experienced shearer, that shear sheep can do it in less than 40 seconds. A good one. But if the sheep fights against them, the process takes longer, and it increases the risk of the sheep getting cut and hurt. You know whenever God wants to take something off of us, that'll be beneficial for us and Him. By the way, the sheep getting the coat off of them, it's beneficial for the sheep. It's cooler. And the bugs and everything, and, and uh, they can run faster and everything away from prey. Not only that, but it's also beneficial for the shepherd. He makes money off of it. You know whenever God takes things away from you and I, it's not only beneficial for us, 
but it's beneficial for him. We can bring him glory then. But he also he often to shear us. He often starts by getting us to shut our mouth, take away your strength, things that you take pride in, bring us closer to him, humble us, bring us down to the ground, and then pin us down. If he wants to ever actually get anything away from us. You all ever try taking away something from your kid goes and grabs something? Your kid ever, your kid ever go up to the table and you go, don't touch that, and he grabs it, I guess, and you go, hey, he take off and go, oh, I got he got the binky in his mouth. You know what you gotta do half the time? You gotta grab him by the arm, and then you're trying to do this, and he's swinging around. You almost gotta pin him down like this and then take it out, out of their hand. Amen. I give you all the illustrations of my bunny rabbit. Amen. All the time we got that indoor bunny rabbit, man though. And you know what he likes to do? He likes to take a balloon that's in the house we leave him to play with. He likes to get that little edge of that thing. And he'll take it in his mouth, and as soon as you go, man, he stops, I guess. And if you take a step towards him, he goes off running on that balloon in his mouth beside him. <laughs> the only way to get it out is to run him into a corner, and then he realizes he's back up in a corner, and he can't get out with the balloon because he's stuck there with the balloon. So he lets go of the balloon and takes off running, amen. But God has to do that with us sometimes. He has to get us in a corner. He has to pin us down before he can start taking things out of our life that he doesn't want to be there. And God, a lot of times, I, I thought this was interesting, a shepherd will a lot of times hire out somebody to come in and shear a sheep for him because it takes too long. It takes a, it's a long time, especially if he's got hundreds of sheep. You know God will often use somebody else to take things away from you and I? You say, Aaron, what do you mean? A lot of times he'll use your flesh. You say, Aaron, what are you, what are you talking about? Your flesh will fight against you. God uses your flesh in the fight against you, and your flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. God will use somebody else to take things out of you, so he'll work on you using the flesh, using the world. God will use the world to take things out of you, people mocking you, people laughing at you, people not taking you serious whenever you witness to them, discouragements that just come from living in the world. He'll use your flesh, he'll use the world, he'll use the devil sometimes to take things away from you and I. He'll use other people, he'll use illnesses, he'll use catastrophes, he'll use a preacher sometimes just to come in and take away what God thinks is necessary. He'll use those things. He's using the Babylonians here. And notice not only the objectives that he gave them, notice the order, that, I'm talking about restoring your focus. The objectives that he gave them, he gave them four of them, but the order. The order that God gave the children of Israel to follow was one that was already tried and proven to work. It was already proven to bring peace. Remember what the order was? Build a house, plant a garden, marry somebody, and have kids. You all probably getting sick of me saying that. So I said it multiple times for a reason, for emphasis. Build a house, plant a garden, get married, and have kids. That was something that God did back in Genesis. In Genesis 1, he builds a house. He builds the whole world. He puts lights in. He puts a foundation in. He puts lights in. He puts the water in. Remember all this in Genesis 1? You got, you got running water. You got borders along the house. It talks about how he divided the, 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 the water from the land. He made foundations. He made a border for that house. He put light there. And then what does he do next? Uh, he plants a garden in Genesis chapter number 2. And a man gets married in Genesis chapter 2. And by Genesis chapter 4, they're having kids. You say, where are you getting at? In difficult times, God is trying to get you and I to get back to the basics of things. The basics of things. Get back to the things, get things back in your life, the basic things of your life in order. Realize what's important and what's not important. See, what was important was them spending time with their family. What was important was them developing a second generation. He said that your sons and daughters would be able to bear children. They'd be able to bear sons and daughters. He says, during this time of captivity, during this time of bondage, you're not just sitting still and sitting idle. I want you to be doing something. I want you to be building something. I want you to be working on something. And I want you to go by the plan that works. Get back to the basics. Things like family devotions in your house. Taking a Bible and opening it up at least a couple times a week. Praying with your family, praying with your children or with your grandchildren, praying with somebody. Get back to the basics of things. Church, get back to praying and fasting. Get back to reading your Bible. I'm talking about the basics of things. God was saying, I just want you to get back down to the bare minimum. I just want you to build a house, live in it, man. Have, get you a farm going, work there, have a family. I just want you to get back to the basics. 
Realize what's important and what's not important. What's not important, I know you've got to make a living, but what's not important is making money. What's not important is buying something else. What's not important is a TV show or a news program. What's not important is a ball team. It's going to blow some of your old minds up. I, uh, I've given enough money to the school so far, and I owe them a whole lot more than you think I'd be more interested in it. Uh, but uh, I, I even have some stock in it. I bought student tickets discounted, and then I resell the tickets to make money off of them. But Ohio State, there they lost yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Dark times. Dark times. <laughs> they lost yesterday. Well, they lost around 3 or 4 o'clock. I didn't find out about until about 6.30 whenever David Poindexter texts me and goes, Oh, how the mighty have fallen. That's my, that's my brother in Christ, amen. He's a Florida Seminole band, or Seminole fan. A Seminole, yeah, Seminole. Uh, but anyways, he's rubbing it in a little bit. They lost. I didn't even know about it. You know what I did on Saturday? I woke up. I prayed. I read my Bible. I got dressed, got, got, a, got some clothes on. I went with my wife, my mother-in-law, my grandmother-in-law. We got in the car. We went and got some signs and some gospel tracts and Bibles and waters and things. We went out to the football game for over an hour. We, we did what I told you this morning. We handed out tracts. We held up street signs. We preached to people. Uh, whenever we were done with that, uh, we went to Bob Evans and ate uh, some food. Whenever we were done with that, I took them home. My wife and I, uh, we had to go to the store, and then we went on a walk in the park. Whenever I got done with that, I came home. I worked on this message. Whenever I was done with that, I worked on something else for the church. Whenever I was done with that, I had dinner with my wife. We played a game of sorry. I beat her three times in a row. <laughs> twice. Beat, her twice. Beat, her twice. <laughs> beat her twice in a row. Uh, I forgot where I was at. I played sorry with my wife. I beat her twice in a row. Okay. And, uh, and then after that, we played the, I practiced the guitar for a little bit. We sang a few hymns. Uh, after that, I, I think we just got ready for bed. We went to bed. We were in bed by 9 o'clock. And don't anybody get nervous. Now, don't anybody get nervous. And I'm not saying this to brag. On Friday, I was in church for two hours. I went out on the street for an hour. I fellowship with the saints of God. They did a street blitz there in Columbus. It was Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, I, did, I went out on the street for an hour. I came back and fellowship for about an hour and a half. I came back home. Uh, I worked on, uh, I think I worked on a Sunday school lesson. And then I, uh, I went and visited my Aunt Tammy in the hospital. And then on that Friday night, I was in church for an hour and a half. I stayed around for an hour then. That was on Friday. On Thursday, I'll just tell you what I did on Thursday. I went to church for an hour and a half in the morning at 10 a.m. I went out on the street for an hour. I came back in fellowship for about half an hour. I went home. I, I went to class for a couple hours, did some homework. I came back home, and I worked on another book that I'm writing. And don't even get nervous. Don't even get nervous. But I didn't make any money during those times. But just so you all know, all my bills are being paid on time. Amen. Don't, don't anybody get nervous, but I didn't work seven days last week, but all my bills are getting paid on time. You say, Aaron, why? I planned ahead for those days coming to save up enough money to where I, none of my bills are going to be behind. You say, Aaron, what are you getting at? The main thing isn't working and making money. <laughs> the main thing isn't football. You know, I watch those uh, athletes go on those little golf carts, and what it is, they're, they're players that they're recruiting. They got their family, they, you see their mother, their father, and maybe a brother or sister, and you see that athlete that's a 16, 17 year old, they're trying to get to come to Ohio State. What they do is they have a big fellowship and a big dinner for them over in the, the stadium, uh, in, in one stadium, and they drive them on golf carts cause, and the, to, the, to the stadium, and they would come by us, and they let them sit down in the front row, all the parents and the families of people they're trying to get to come to the university. And man, they're all decked out. The mom's got on proud mother of an honor roll student. And the dad's got their football team shirt on that they're in high school. And uh, man, they're, the, 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 the athlete's either got a high state shirt on or he's got his hometown uh, team on, uh, whatever it is. And they're going there, man. They're driving. And they got them driving through, man. They're living like kings, man. 16, 17-year-olds, man. I'm talking about they're sitting back in a golf cart riding through Columbus with, with, a, with a private tour. You want to go sit in the front of the stadium? I mean, living the life. Living the life. Scholarships and everything. Man, I mean, superstars. 109,000 people paid money just to come watch them play yesterday. 109,000 people, and there were hundreds of thousands of others watching them on TV. I went to get foot orthotics the other day for my shoes uh, to I have flat feet. I went to a physical therapist, and uh, she does suicide prevention training. She actually did it for our therapy program. And uh, she told me this. She said, uh, she goes, I just got a call two weeks ago, and it was from one of the athletic the uh, people up there uh, that are high up in the office, they said they needed an emergency suicide prevention training for over 400 coaches, I believe it was. She had to do four of them. I believe it was like four suicide prevention trainings for 100 people each for all the coaches of all the athletes there at Ohio State. They said, we need you to do it within the next three days. Can you please do this for me? You want to know why? Because since COVID and everything's been shut down and everyone's anxiety is up and everybody's nervous and depressed, 
they found like never before all these 18, 19 year olds that are living the dream, man, are suicidal and depressed. Wanting to end their life with a gun, with dope, with some pills, with something to just let them die easier, die soft. They're wanting to end their lives. And yet you have parents today that teach their kids the number one thing in life is that you go to college. And if you can't do that, be good at sports, but do something like that. That's not the priority. Amen. It's not. And it's not going to bring them peace. It's not going to bring them joy. It's not going to bring them happiness. It's not going to bring them a good home. That's not what matters. You know what Jeremiah was telling me? He said, you've got to get back to the things that are actually important, the things that actually matter, the things that will actually last in eternity. You've got to get back to the basics of things. You know what else she told me? I'll just throw this in there. She said they've been having a problem with all the, her other therapists that are working for her. She said they keep coming to her, and this is what they've been saying over this last year. They said, we have an issue. It's something that's going on. And they said, we need to talk to you about it. They said, number one, we need to be trained in suicide prevention. And number two, we can't get our patients to leave. They're allowed, to, they're allowed to have so many people come in for therapy. They just couldn't be in all at once. She said, people will talk to us, the therapists, nonstop. And we literally have to like push them out the door because they're just wanting somebody to talk to. They've been shut up in their houses. They're nervous. They're scared about everything. They just want somebody to talk to. Folks, this world out here, I don't know about you, but I have perfect peace this morning. You know, we were singing those songs and everything. Yeah. My heart, man, I, I felt like I was on cloud nine. I felt like I was just floating through the air. I had perfect peace. Folks, don't take that for granted because they don't have that out there. Amen. They don't. Get back to the things that matter. He's saying prioritize, plan things, get things back in priority the way they should be. So number one, he wants us to restore our focus. Number two, he wants us to renew our fellowship. And I'll hurry. He wants us to renew our fellowship. Restore our focus. Get things back in your life that are important. Put them where they belong. Number two, restore our fellow or renew our fellowship. Renew our fellowship. Captivity, I struggle to get away from point one on priorities. Let me just say this. You can do something good, but if it's not in its right place, it's bad. And it'll hinder you. I know men that preach again. I got a young man right now that uh, he came to me and he said he wants to go to college and go to law school. And I'm encouraging him to go to college. I'm helping him go to college. He comes to me and says, my pastor's always talking about how if you go to college, you're not right with God. And I don't believe that. What it is is the pastor is self-conscious about his own educational status, so he wants to put his thing off on somebody else. I don't believe that. College can be a good thing. Working a job is a good thing. It's a required thing. You are supposed to work. And all God's people said, hey, Amen. you're not supposed to sit around on YouTube and hope to be famous one day off YouTube. That's not the American way. That's the millennial way. Uh, but you're supposed to go to work. Those are good things, but they're not in their priorities. As near they begin to hurt you. They begin to hurt you. Restore your focus. Number two, renew your fellowship. Captivity... It's not just for punishment, but it's a new beginning. When a child disobeys his father, the fellowship is broken. The chastisement comes from the father, is so that he, he, the chastisement that comes from the father is so that the wrong can be judged wrong. The father has to judge the wrong as wrong. That's why the chastisement comes. There's a reason for it, but it's so that the penalty can be appropriated, be, you know, the carried out judgment's carried out, and the sentence of sin is served. Meaning, the sentence of sin is served. It's over with. You judge what the child did. It was wrong. You carried out judgment upon it. The father does that. The Bible says the blueness of the wound cleanseth away evil. When the, the blueness of the wound, chastisement, that cleans away the wrong that was done. The sentence is served, and the, the, the child has, has served their sentence of doing wrong. The rod of reproof, when mixed with repentance, the child has to be repentant, and righteous intentions by the parent, brings forth reconciliation between the two parties. If you chastise your son or daughter and there's not reconciliation afterwards, something's wrong. What a lot of people do is they either don't chastise their child at all or they chastise them, but it's too much and it's the wrong way. Chastisement ought to bring you and the child closer together. I talked about earlier about your heart being soft enough and tender enough. Whenever, you're, whenever a child's crying or you're crying, it's because you're, you're stirred up, you're emotionally distraught. The child needs that. To break that hard heart and that spirit of rebellion that's in every every child and every human. He needs that to break that so that way while that heart is soft, the father can take that child into his arms and say, do you understand? The rod of reproof, that means teaching. Teaching. Do you understand what you did wrong? If the child doesn't understand why you're chastising, it doesn't know good to chastise him. 
But the reason why you do it is that you can bring the two parties, the, the, the parent and child, back together. And they can have peace and unity. Do you want to know why God chastises you and me? It's not just to shame us, it's not to punish us, it's, he's trying to bring us closer together. He's trying to bring you and more in fellowship with him. The reason why he allows things to happen to you and I is he's trying to get you to where you have a soft and tender heart, you're repentant, and he reproves you and teaches you why he's allowing this to happen. He doesn't just leave you in the dark, so that way you can have fellowship with him. You know pain in general brings forth appreciation of life. Pain in general will bring forth an appreciation of life. You say, what do you mean? Whenever you're exercising, that's painful. But your body feels better after you do it. That's why it's a good thing to do. If you don't have a physical demanding job, you should exercise some. Now, exercise childbirth. Physical pain brings forth life. Surgery. Pain brings forth healing. Calvary. Pain brought forth life. Pain brings forth an appreciation of life. And God puts you and I through pain so we can appreciate His goodness and renew our fellowship with Him. I want to move on. So number one, you can restore your focus. Why does God allow us to go to the dark rooms of life? Number two, so we can renew our fellowship. And number three, quickly, He wants us to know that in difficult times, revival can be found. Revival can be found. In difficult times, revival can be found. Jeremiah is telling them the four things I told you many times. Build a house, plant a garden, marry somebody, and have kids. To prepare them for what was coming. Verse number 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then, he said, then, when all this is over, ye shall call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you, I will listen to you. Ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Doesn't that sound like a revival? I will be found of you, saith the Lord. God's not going to stay in the dark whenever you're looking for Him. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. God's preparing them for revival. And folks, you know what God's preparing this world for right now? He's preparing the world for what's going to come. Amen. The reason why things are the way that they are is because God's coming back to get us in the rapture. Right? And he's preparing the world for the tribulation. But he's preparing the world for the rapture and then the tribulation after that. And just so you know, you don't have to prepare for the tribulation. You don't have to prepare for that. You prepare for the rapture. But God is not only preparing the world for what's to come, he's preparing you and I for what's to come. God is preparing you to minister to somebody that you won't be able to unless you go through the dark times and the dark rooms. He's preparing you to do a work for Him, whether it's at the church or out in the world. He's preparing something inside of you. He's working on you to prepare you for what's to come. He may be preparing you for victory. He may be preparing you to, to, to start something new, but He's preparing you for what is to come. Notice two things about this expected end. He didn't say when it was, and He didn't say what it was. Why? Because He didn't want them to focus on the end. He didn't want them to focus on the end. He didn't want them to focus on deliverance. Folks, you want to know why I'm not too worried about dating things and worried about when things are going to come and who the Antichrist is and whether or not all this is not the mark of the beast and all this stuff. You want to know why I'm not worried about that? God didn't tell me specifically what all that was because he doesn't want me to know about it. He's more concerned with the process of our lives rather than the end. You know what? You know what kids usually ask? They say, when is this drive going to be over? Are we there yet? They usually ask, when is church going to be over? You want to know where they learn that question from? They learn that from their parents. Amen? <laughs> when is this going to be over? When's the end of all this? When is all this going to happen? End times, end times. Everybody's into end time things. Instead of restoring their focus, instead of renewing their fellowship, instead of finding revival, uh, then they want to know when the end of things is. God wants them to realize why they were there in their first place. It's because they left their first love. We've read it in verse number 12. Look at verses 12 through 14. Then shall ye call upon me, God, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me 
when ye shall search for me with all your heart, verse 14, and I, God, will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will return to your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places, whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place which I caused you to be carried away captive. You know what God's saying? He said, I want things to get back to where it's just about you and it's just about me. God said, I want to bring you to a place where nothing else matters. No, no, the world doesn't matter. Your friends don't matter. Your job doesn't matter. I want to bring you to a place where we renew our fellowship one with another. We, there's revival found. And it's just about me, God. And it's about you, child of God. He said, I want you to get back to whenever it was just me and you. Whenever things were simple. Whenever you had a pure childlike faith, whenever you used to pray with zeal, and you used to believe that God was going to answer, whenever you used to ask God for big things, like give me somebody to witness to this week, or give me somebody to lead to the Lord this week, or God increase my giving, or God save my loved one, He wants to get back to whenever you had a childlike faith, whenever you said, God, I believe that you're able to do all things, and all things are possible with you, God. God, I believe that you are. You're the sweetest thing in my life. I love talking to you. I love praying to you. I love reading my Bible. I love thinking about you, God. God said, I want it to get back to where it's just me, God, and you. Revival can be found in dark times. And God said, I got you into it, and I'm going to get you out of it. He said, the end is coming, but you can't focus on the end. Focus not on the end, but the process. Allow God to develop you in darkness. And don't worry about the end, don't worry about me. And child of God, I'll tell you this in closing. Don't worry about how everything's going to work out. Don't worry about how everything's going to work out. Don't worry about the, don't worry about the future in that sense. Say, God, I want to settle down spiritually. I want to get back to the basics. I want to renew my fellowship with you. And God, I want to find revival on a regular basis. I want to be stirred up for you to do something for you. And child of God, would you allow, maybe you're not in a time of darkness right now, but down the road maybe you will be, but would you... Would you with me say, God, I want you to develop us. I want you to develop us as a church, as a family, and I want you to develop me as an individual in times of darkness. Let's all bow our heads and stand. Sister Ruth will come up and uh, play.